Hello guys, so in this video, I'm going to give you a super quick revision on the whole of the auditor's chapter. All right, let's begin without any delay. Our very first learning over here in this chapter was about competent authority. Who is going to be the competent authority in a company? It will either be audit committee or board of directors. If the company has an audit committee, then the audit committee will be the competent authority. If the company does not have an audit committee, then the board of directors will be the competent authority. Which companies require audit committee? Number one, all listed companies require audit committee. In addition to listed companies, all those unlisted public companies with paid up share capital at least 10 crores or turnover at least 100 crores or outstanding loans, borrowings, debentures, deposits, LBDD, outstanding loans, borrowings, debentures, just deposits are more than 50 crores please notice at least at least more than right guys so audit committee is required by which companies number one audit committee is required by all listed companies number two it is required by all those unlisted public companies which have a paid up share capital come on tell me paid up share capital at least 10 crores or uh, or turnover, turnover at least 100 crores or outstanding loans, borrowings, debentures or deposits more than 50 crores. Any one out of these three criteria fulfilled audit committee is required. Once you have an audit committee, you will continue to have audit committee. If there are three consecutive years where none of these criteria are fulfilled, then you can discontinue the audit committee. Once without seeing, tell me which company requires audit committee. Number one, all listed companies. Number two, all those unlisted public companies with paid up share capital at least how many crores? At least 10 crores or with turnover at least 100 crores or outstanding loans, borrowings, debentures, deposits more than 50 crores. Paid up share capital at least 10 crores or turnover at at least 100 crores or outstanding loans, borrowings, debentures, deposits, more than 50 crores. All right, guys. Then after this, we had learned the whole process that how do we select the auditor? How is the auditor appointed? See, end of the day, auditor is appointed by whom? End of the day, auditor is appointed by the shareholders in the general meeting by passing one simple ordinary resolution. End of the day, the auditor is appointed by the shareholders in the general meeting by passing one simple ordinary resolution. But what is the whole process? It all starts with selecting the auditor. Now, who will select the auditor? The competent authority will do the hard work. The competent authority is going to consider totally three things. On the basis of these three things, the competent authority will select the auditor. What are the three things? Number one, what is the qualification and experience of the auditor? QE. What is the qualification and experience of the auditor? Then whether this qualification and experience, is it commensurate? Commensurate means what? Is the qualifications and experience enough for the size and requirements of a company? Can a fresher chartered accountant audit Reliance Industries Limited? No, he does not have enough experience. So the competent authority will check what is the qualifications and experience of the auditor? Is it commensurate with the size and requirements of the company? And what are the orders and pending proceedings relating to professional or other misconduct in front of the ICAI competent authority or any court? competent authority, for example, NAFRA. So basically, the third point is whether against this particular chartered accountant is any order already passed or is any case going on relating to professional misconduct? Where is the case going on? Who passed the order? Either court or some competent authority like NAFRA or ICAI. Okay, so the competent authority is going to consider three things. Number one, what are the qualifications and experience? Number two, whether those qualifications and experience are commensurate with the size and requirements of the company? And number three, what are the orders and pending proceedings relating to what? Relating to professional misconduct where ICI any competent authority or court where ICAI, any competent authority or court. So without seeing, tell me, the competent authority is going to look at how many things? Three things. On the basis of these three things, they will select the auditor. What's the first thing? The first thing is whether, uh, first thing is what are the qualifications and experience of the auditor? Second thing, whether the qualifications and experience are commensurate with the size and requirements of the company. And number three, well, what are the orders and pending proceedings related to professional misconduct where before ICAI, any competent authority or any court. On the basis of these three things, the competent authority will select the auditor. Can the competent authority itself appoint the auditor also? No, guys. Who will appoint? The shareholders will appoint. See, we know very well that the competent authority can either be board of directors or audit committee. If competent authority is board of directors, 
on the basis of the three things they have selected by an auditor, right? They will simply recommend that auditor whom they have selected. They will simply recommend to whom? They will simply recommend to the shareholders and shareholders will appoint. But however, the whole drama unfolds when the competent authority is audit committee. If the competent authority is audit committee, audit committee cannot directly recommend to shareholders. Audit committee will recommend to whom? To the board of directors. Now, there are two possibilities. Board may be okay with the recommendation. Board may not be okay with the recommendation. If the board agrees with the recommendation, then the board will pass on the recommendation to the shareholders. But, but, but what if the board disagrees with the recommendation? What if the board is not okay with the recommendation? Then, triple R. In that case, board will refer back the matter to the audit committee. The board will request the audit committee, please reconsider your recommendation. And the board will also give reasons that why are they disagreeing in the first place? Why are they not okay with the recommendation in the first place? They will inform the audit committee. Now, audit committee, two things are possible. Either audit committee may say, may be like, okay, fine, I'll give you another name. Audit committee may recommend another person's name to the board or audit committee may say, no, 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 my decision is final only. My recommendation is final only. If the audit committee is willing to give another person's name, whole process will repeat again this. But if the audit committee refuses to reconsider, then the board will send to the shareholders its own recommendation. Board will send to the shareholders its own recommendation. But in that case, the board will have to record in writing that what are the reasons why are they not okay with the audit committee's recommendation. Crystal clear, guys. So this is the process of recommending the auditor. If the competent authority is board of directors, board will directly recommend to the shareholders. But if the competent authority is audit committee, audit committee will recommend to the board of directors. If the board agrees with the recommendation, board will pass on the recommendation to the shareholders. But if the board disagrees with the recommendation, the board will refer back the matter, request reconsideration, and also give reasons that why are they disagreeing with the with the um, recommendation. Now, if the audit committee is willing to reconsider, great, whole process we will repeat again. But if the audit committee says, no, my decision is final. If the audit committee refuses to reconsider, then the board will send their own recommendation to the shareholders after recording in writing the reasons that why were they not okay with the audit committee's recommendation. Okay, then listen to the next point. The uh, next point after this, so what is, we are learning about the process, right? The process of uh, appointing the auditor. The first step in the process is that we are going to consider these three things. On the basis of these three things, we will select the auditor. Then the second part was this discussion that I had with you over here. This whole process wherein we are recommending the appointment to the shareholders. Okay, now coming to the third step in this, in this process. See, before we can appoint the auditor, the auditor has to give to the company two things. The auditor has to give to the company a written consent saying, yes, yes, I am willing to be appointed as the auditor of the company. And number two, he also has to give a certificate. Now, inside the certificate, what are we going to write? Inside the certificate, we are going to write totally five things. Thing number one, the auditor will write in the certificate that I am eligible to be appointed. I am not disqualified. Neither under Companies Act nor under Chartered Accountants Act, I am not disqualified. Then thing number two, if you appoint me as auditor, my appointment will be as per the term of appointment which is given in the Companies Act. Then number three, all right. So number one in the certificate, we will write that if the company appoints me as the auditor, I am eligible for appointment and I am not disqualified, neither under Companies Act nor under Chartered Accountants Act. Number two, if I am appointed as the auditor, my appointment will be as per the term of appointment given under the Act. Number three, if you appoint me as the auditor, the appointment will be within the limit. Which limit, guys? You know very well, right? An auditor can be appointed maximum only in 20 companies. So if the company appoints me as auditor, the appointment will be within the limit of 20 companies. Then number four, the auditor in that certificate, he has to give a list of the cases which are going on against him relating to professional misconduct. And then he'll also mention in the certificate that this list which I have given over here, that list is true and correct. And number five, he has to mention that he's fulfilling section 141, which means he's 
for he's he's qualified he is not attracting any disqualification he's eligible to be appointed as an auditor he's qualified and he's not attracting any disqualification these five things he will put in the certificate and he will give in the company he'll give to the company so before appointment as auditor the auditor has to give to the company how many things two things thing number one he has to give a written consent saying that he is willing to be appointed as an auditor and number two he has to give a certificate in that certificate he will write totally five things number one that he's eligible for appointment and the companies are also under chartered account chart also he is not attracting any disqualification number 2 if you appoint me as the auditor my appointment will be as per the term of appointment number 3 if you appoint me as the auditor it will be within the limit given in the companies act that is within 20 companies limit number 4 these are the list of cases which are going on against me relating to professional misconduct and this list which i have given above that list is correct and true and lastly section 141 is fulfilled so all this he will give to the company and finally the shareholders will appoint the auditor in the general meeting by passing one simple ordinary resolution they will appoint the auditor then company will inform the auditor congratulations auditor you have been appointed as the auditor of the company and company will also inform the roc company will inform the roc not in 30 days in 15 days company will inform the roc within 15 days that you know roc we have appointed so and so person as auditor So, what are all the steps for appointment of the auditor? First of all, the competent authority will consider those three criteria. On the basis of the three criteria, the competent authority will select the auditor. Then, the competent authority will recommend the auditor to the shareholders. If the competent authority is board of directors, the board of directors will directly recommend to the shareholders. But if the competent authority is audit committee, audit committee to the board, board to the shareholders. Then, the third step that auditor will give to the company two things. He will give to the company a written consent saying that he is willing to be. appointed as an auditor and number 2 he will also give a certificate to the company con containing five things then finally after this the last step he said that the shareholders will now appoint the auditors the shareholders will appoint the auditors in the agm by passing one simple ordinary resolution they will appoint the auditors and then the company will inform two people guys company will inform the auditor hey listen you have been appointed as auditor of the company and company will inform roc also company will inform the roc within 15 days of appointment Itself, that you have that you know we have appointed so and so person as auditor. So this was our entire process with respect to the selection and appointment of auditor. So first of all, we have learned over here that who is competent authority, which companies require audit committee, and then we have learned the whole process of appointing the auditor. Now let's come to our next discussion. First auditor, the first auditor of the company. I'm talking about non-government companies first. In non-government companies, from the date of incorporation within thirty days, the board of directors is supposed to appoint the auditor. Now the board cannot delegate this uh, duty to any individual director. Board cannot delegate this duty to any committee. Board means board only has to appoint within thirty days from the date of incorporation. If the board is not appointing within thirty days from the date of incorporation, then the shareholders, when EGM will be called and the shareholders will do the appointment within 90 days from the date of incorporation which means the shareholders are going to get extra 60 days but don't write extra 60 days in your answer paper because examiner is not going to use his buddhi he is not going to think that okay 30 plus 60 is 90 he will think oh you wrote 60 you should have written 90 he will mark it wrong So you please be careful. You use the same terminology, please. So from the date of incorporation within thirty days, the board of directors will do the appointment, and the board cannot delegate this to any person. Board cannot delegate it to the committee also. Board cannot delegate to managing director also. Board cannot delegate to any individual director also. Board means board only has to appoint within thirty days. But if the board is not appointing within thirty days, then the shareholders, when EGM will be called, and they themselves will appoint the first auditor within ninety days from incorporation. operation of the company the first auditor will hold office not for 5 years no 5 years term for him the first auditor will hold office till the conclusion of the first agm okay then what about the government companies in government companies from the date of incorporation within 60 days the controller and auditor general will appoint if he is not appointing within 60 days then within the next 30 days the board of directors will appoint if the board is also not appointing within the next 30 days then within the next 60 days shareholders will appoint in an agm okay so in in a government company from the date of incorporation within 60 days the cneg will appoint if he is not so appointing within the next 30 days the board will appoint if the board is not so appointing within the next 60 days the members will appoint in the egm first auditor will hold office till when first auditor will hold office till the conclusion of the first agm now coming to casual vacancy casual vacancy means the term of the auditor is not over we had appointed him for a particular term the term is not over even before the term is over his chair has become empty 
Now we have to fill that chair. But why did the chair become empty? Because of DDRR. It became empty because of death, disqualification, resignation or removal. It became empty because of death, disqualification, resignation, removal. So cash and vacancy means the term of the auditor is not over yet. Even before his term is over, his chair has become empty. There is vacancy in his office. Why is there vacancy? Either he died during his term or he attracted a disqualification in his term. Now he can't continue as auditor. Bye-bye. He has vacated. Or he is resigning. Term is not over. Before that itself he is resigning. Or term is not over. And we are removing him. So his term is not over. But his office has become vacant. Now we can't let his chair be vacant guys. Another auditor has to be appointed in his place. So who is going to fill the vacancy? Who is going to appoint another auditor in his place guys? The board of directors are going to appoint. The board of directors will fill the vacancy. Within 30 days itself the board will fill the vacancy. But however... If the vacancy, if the casual vacancy is because of resignation, even their board will fill within 30 days. But extra, extra responsibility there. Are you listening? If the casual vacancy is because of resignation, the board will fill it within 30 days. But extra, extra responsibility over there. What extra responsibility? After the board fills a casual vacancy within 30 days, after that, within three months, the shareholders have to approve the appointment by passing one ordinary resolution. Understanding everybody. So we are talking about non-government companies first. In non-government companies, if there is any casual vacancy, casual vacancy means what? Casual vacancy means the term of the auditor has not expired yet. Even before the term is expired, even before that, there is a vacancy in his office. How come? Because of DDRR, because of death, disqualification, resignation or removal. Because of these four reasons, there is a casual vacancy. Now, who will fill in the vacancy, guys? The board of directors. Within how much time, guys? Within 30 days. But however, in resignation cases, one extra responsibility is there. Board will fill within 30 days but we also need approval of shareholders within the next three months by passing an ordinary resolution. Okay, but what if the company is a government company? In government company, CNAJ full 100% interference. So if it's a government company and in a government company there is casual vacancy, then within 30 days the CNAG will fill in the vacancy by appointing another auditor. If the CNAG is not filling the vacancy within 30 days, then within the next 30 days, the board of directors will fill the vacancy. In government companies, whether the casual vacancy is because of resignation or whatever other reason, no concept of going to the shareholders, asking for approval, three months, ordinary resolution, no special treatment for resignation in government companies. Understanding everybody. So if the company happens to be a government company, the uh, casual vacancy will be filled in by the CNAG within 30 days. If the CNAG is not filling it within 30 days, then the board of directors will fill the vacancy within the next 30 days. Uh, and over here, even if the vacancy is because of resignation, no special treatment. And finally, the cash and vacancy auditor will hold office till when? He will not hold office for the leftover term. He will hold office only till the conclusion of the next AGM. Okay? So, cash and vacancy auditor, what did we discuss, guys? If the company happens to be a non-government company, then who will fill in the vacancy? The board of directors will fill in the vacancy by appointing another auditor within 30 days. They will fill in the vacancy. But however, if the, vac if the cash and vacancy is because of resignation, Resignation. Even the same board will fill within 30 days. But in addition to that, we also need the shareholders approval. How? By passing an ordinary resolution at a EGM, at a general meeting. Okay. But what if my company happens to be a government company? In a government company, from the date of casual vacancy, within 30 days, the CNAG will fill in the vacancy. If the CNAG is not filling the vacancy, then within the next 30 days, who will fill the vacancy? The board of directors will fill the vacancy. Here, even if the casual vacancy is because of resignation, still, there is no question of me going to the shareholders and asking them for approval. No special treatment for resignation in government companies. And finally, we discussed that the casual vacancy auditor, he will hold office till then till the conclusion of the next AGM. Okay, the uh, first auditor till the conclusion of the first AGM. Casual vacancy auditor till the conclusion of the next AGM. Okay, now coming to the term of office of auditors. This concept of term of office of auditors is applicable only to some specified companies. It is applicable to listed companies, unlisted public companies with paid up share capital at least 10 crores, private companies with paid up share capital at least 50 crores, and all companies, whether public, whether private, with outstanding borrowings from financial institutions and banks and public 
public deposits at least 50 crores. So it's applicable to four companies, listed companies, public companies with paid up share capital at least 10 crores, uh, private companies with paid up share capital at least 50 crores, and all companies public or private with borrowings from financial institutions and banks and public deposits at least 50 crores. So these companies, we can appoint an individual for only one term of five years. Am I saying up to five years? No, I am saying one term of five years, which means one term equal to five years. It can't be less. It can't be more. It has to be equal to five years. So we can appoint individual for one term of five years. And if we are appointing a firm, we can appoint the firm for two terms of five years, five years each. Can we appoint the firm in one go itself for 10 years, no. At a time, we can appoint for one term of five years. After one term is over, if we want, we can reappoint for another term of five years. So at a time, we can appoint the auditor for one term and that one term will always be of five years, equal to five years, not less, not more. Okay. So individual, we can appoint only for one term. Audit a firm, we can appoint for only two terms. After this one term, after these two terms, we have to give a cooling period of five years. In this five years, we don't want the same auditor to be appointed again. In the five years, we don't want to appoint any partner of this firm. In this five years, we don't want to appoint any other firm which has common partner. Also, in these five years, we do not want to appoint any other uh, firm which belongs to the same network of the firms. Also, in this retiring auditor, there is a partner who was partner in charge. He has left this firm and he has gone and joined another firm. Now, even this firm can't be appointed. In simple words, guys, in the cooling period, we want pure independence. In the cooling period, the auditor who is going to audit the company's uh, financials, he has to be independent. He should not be connected in any manner with the outgoing auditor. Understanding in the cooling period, who cannot be appointed as auditor, guys, once again, in the cooling period, who cannot be appointed as auditor? In the cooling period, the same auditor cannot be appointed as auditor once again. That firm's partner also cannot be appointed as auditor. Any other firm which is having a common partner also cannot be appointed as an auditor. Any other firm which belongs to the same network of firms also cannot be appointed as an auditor. Also, if in, let's say, let's say the auditor of the company was A, B, C and Co. Mr. A was a partner in charge. He was the one who was certifying the financial statements also. Now he left this firm and he went and joined, let us say X, Y, Z and Co. He went and joined. So this partner, Mr. A has come and joined this firm. Now this firm also in the cooling period cannot be appointed as auditor of the company. So any partner in charge who leaves the outgoing auditor and joins another firm, even this firm cannot be appointed during the cooling period because come on, tell me there is no independence, right? This firm is connected to the outgoing partner. So during the cooling period, we don't want any connection with, between the auditor and the outgoing auditor. So during the cooling period, we want an independent auditor. So during the cooling period, same auditor cannot be appointed. Any other firm with common partner cannot be uh, appointed. Any other firm which belongs to the same network of firm cannot be appointed. Also, if our partner in charge has left our firm and has gone and joined another firm, even that other firm cannot be appointed during the cooling period. After the cooling period, welcome back. No problem. Okay, guys, everybody is clear. This concept, however, is not applicable to 1% companies and small companies. It's applicable to whom? It's applicable to listed companies, unlisted public companies with paid up share capital at least 10 crores, private companies with paid up share capital at least 50 crores, and companies with borrowings from banks or financial institutions and public deposits put together at least 50 crores. To these companies, it is applicable. They can appoint an individual for one term of five years after that cooling period of five years. If it's a firm, firm can be appointed for two terms of five years, five years each after that cooling period of five years. In the cooling period, we want pure independence. Okay. And then after this, listen to my next discussion. This term of office, this cooling period concept was only for the specified companies. What about other companies? For other companies, no cooling period concept, which means we can appoint the auditor for one term of five years. One term is over, again, welcome. We can reappoint once again. Second term over, again, we can reappoint once again. Like that, we can keep on reappointing the same auditor again and again. No cooling period concept for other companies. But even in other companies, one term will be off five years only.
okay then however what is my company it's a government company in government company from the commencement of the financial year within 180 days itself the auditor will be appointed by the cndg in a government company the cndg will appoint the auditor within 180 days from the commencement of the financial year and he will hold office till the conclusion of the agm for that particular year so in government companies we don't have five years term concept in government companies from the commencement of the financial year within 180 days cnag will appoint and the auditor whom the cnag is appointing he will hold office till when guys he will hold office till the conclusion of the agm for that particular year so this was our entire discussion with respect to term of office so we spoke about term of office for these specified companies here there will be cooling period of 5 years other companies no cooling period so we can keep reappointing again and again but at a time we can appoint an auditor for one term of 5 years examiner will ask companies other company companies not a specified company can we appoint one particular auditor forever no even in other companies we can appoint the auditor at a time for a term of the 5 years we can't appoint him forever at a time we can appoint for 5 years but no cooling period concept so we can keep on reappointing and if it is a government company we will appoint the auditor the cnag will appoint the auditor within 180 days from the commencement of the financial year and he will hold office till the conclusion of the agm for that financial year okay guys then listen to my next discussion reappointment of retiring auditor wherever reappointment is possible we assume that the retiring auditor itself has been reappointed i'll repeat again wherever reappointment is possible we assume that the retiring auditor itself is reappointed but however if he is disqualified or if he has given a notice saying i am not willing to be appointed as the auditor again or if the shareholders have passed a special resolution saying don't appoint him once again then we cannot reappoint him i'll repeat once again wherever reappointment is possible in all those cases we will assume that the same retiring auditor itself has been reappointed wherever reappointment is possible we assume that the retiring auditor itself has been reappointed however when will this assumption not hold good if the retiring auditor is attracting some disqualification then how can you reappoint him you can't reappoint him number two the retiring auditor has given a written notice saying that he is unwilling he is not willing to be reappointed if he is not willing to be reappointed we can't force him and number three if the shareholders have passed a special resolution saying please don't reappoint him appoint anybody else please don't reappoint him or appoint a specific person just don't reappoint him appoint some other person if the shareholders have pass a special resolution then if if any of these three cases exist then the retiring auditor cannot be reappointed otherwise wherever reappointment is possible generally we assume that the retiring auditor has been reappointed then comes a the next discussion resignation of auditor can the auditor resign yes he can resign before the completion of his term any time he can resign but if he wants to resign he has to inform the company and the roc within 30 days of resignation and if it's a government company he also has to inform cnag now when he is informing the company roc cnag when he is informing them he he has to tell them number one the fact that he is resigning and number two he has to give reasons also that why is he resigning understanding so whenever the auditor decides to resign he has to give a statement a statement to whom statement to company statement to roc and statement to cnag cnag of course will come into the picture only if it is a government company now in the statement what is he going to write he is going to write reasons that i why why exactly is he resigning he will first of all put the fact that i am resigning and number two the reasons that why exactly is he resigning now when he sends his resignation statement to the company can the company say no 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 resignation not accepted can the company say that no company we are not asking you for your approval this is fyi this is for your information company that i am resigning i am not asking you for permission i am not asking you for approval i am informing you that hey listen i am resigning so there is no question of the company accepting my resignation or not accepting my resignation all that comes into the picture only with respect to employees i am auditor i am not employee of the company so i can resign whenever i want simply by giving a statement i'll give a statement to whom to the company to the roc and to the cnag i'll give the statement within 30 days and in the statement i will write number one the fact that i am resigning and number two reason why i am resigning then comes the next discussion removal of auditor you tell me who appointed the auditor shareholders so who can remove the auditor 
shareholders who appointed the auditor shareholders so who can remove the auditor the shareholders so if you want to remove the auditor first of all the shareholders have to take initiative the shareholders have to send a special notice to the company telling the company that they want to remove the auditor special notice guys meetings chapter section 115 you've learned already so uh, the shareholders will first of all send a special notice to the company saying that they want to remove the auditor then the board of directors will call one board meeting and in that the board of directors will pass a board resolution that okay fine let's remove the auditor from the date of the board resolution within 30 days itself the company will now have to make an application to central government central government will give approval once we get central government's approval within 60 days a shareholders meeting will be called in this shareholders meeting we will first give the auditor an opportunity of being heard and then the shareholders will pass a special resolution and they will remove him please remember if you want to appoint the auditor the shareholders pass a simple ordinary resolution but when the shareholders want to remove the auditor they pass a special resolution Okay, so to remove the auditor, what are the steps guys? First of all, the shareholders will send a special notice to the company saying that they want to remove the auditor. Then the board of directors will call a board meeting and in the board meeting, they will pass a board resolution. From the date of passing this board resolution, within 30 days itself, they will make an application to whom? They will make an application to the central government and will ask central government's approval. Then central government will give approval to the company. Once a company gets central government approval, within 60 days, the company has to call a general meeting of the shareholders. In this general meeting, first of all, we have to give an opportunity of being heard to the auditor and then finally we will have to pass a special resolution removing the auditor okay guys then after this we had learned about appointing auditors other than the retiring auditor that is if the shareholders see there is a retiring auditor okay there is a retiring auditor and reappointment is possible whenever reappointment is possible what do we prefer whenever reappointment is possible generally we prefer to reappoint the same auditor itself but reappointment is possible but the shareholders don't want to reappoint him reappointment is possible but shareholders don't want to reappoint him shareholders are telling the company he's anyways retiring please don't reappoint him appoint anybody else just don't reappoint him or shareholders are telling the company he's reappointing let's not reappoint him instead let's appoint this time abc and co so either the shareholders are telling the company don't reappoint him appoint anybody else just don't reappoint him or the shareholders are telling the company appoint one specific person in his place now to do this again the shareholders will send a special notice to the company as soon as the company receives the special notice the company will immediately forthwith send a copy of this notice to the retiring auditor the retiring auditor will make a written representation to the company through which he will request the members that please don't do this with me please reappoint me itself then the company will send a copy of the representation to all the shareholders but however if the representation is received too late from the auditor then it is not possible to send to all the shareholders in that case company will simply file it with the roc and read it out at the meeting now at the meeting also we have to give him an opportunity once again to be heard orally all right so what is the situation over here the situation over here it says a retiring auditor reappointment is possible shareholders don't want to reappoint him so first of all the shareholders will send a special notice to the company then immediately company will send a copy of this special notice to whom to the retiring auditor then this retiring auditor will make a written representation to the company and the company will the company will send a copy of this written representation to all the members but if if this written representation the retiring auditor if he has sent it to the company very late if it is not possible for the company to send it to all the members then the company will simply file it with the roc and the company will read it out at the uh, at the meeting then at the meeting we have to give the auditor an opportunity of being heard orally so are you noticing we are giving him two opportunities guys first we are giving him an opportunity to make a written representation and then we are giving him one more opportunity to make an oral representation all right guys so these are your steps first of all the company will uh, first of all the shareholders have to give a special notice to the company then the company will immediately send a copy of the special notice to the retiring auditor then the retiring auditor will give a written representation to the company the company will send a copy of the written representation to all the members of the company then the uh, members of the company in, in case the written representation is received very late no need to send it to all the members the company can simply file it with the roc and read it out at the meeting okay then at the meeting also we have to give him an opportunity of being heard orally all right now in case in case in case the retiring auditor has given this written representation he is uh, he's given this written representation but if he is misusing or if he's abusing this power 
don't you think they're giving a right to the retiring auditor they're giving him a right to give a written representation but if he's abusing this right if he's misusing this right because of which the company or any other person is getting negatively affected then in that case the company or any aggrieved person can make an application to the nclt they can tell the nclt nclt see the retiring auditor is misusing his right he has given written representation but see what and all is written in the written representation he is unnecessarily insulting the company it is going to be against the interests of the company if the nclt is convinced that the retiring auditor is misusing his power nclt will pass an order saying that no need to send the written representation to the members so no need to send the written representation to the members no need to read out the written representation at the meeting if nclt is convinced that the retiring auditor is misusing or abusing this power okay so this was our discussion with respect to uh, appointing an auditor other than retiring auditor the shareholders are saying that the auditor is retiring we don't want to reappoint him all right a reappointment is possible but we don't want to reappoint him for that the shareholders will send a special notice to the company company will send a copy of the special notice to the retiring auditor retiring auditor will make a written representation company will send the written representation to all the members this written representation should be of reasonable length the written representation should not be 1000 pages it should be of reasonable length but however if the auditor sends a written representation too late if it is not possible for the company to send a copy of the written representation to all the members then in that case the company will simply file a copy with the roc and read it out at the meeting in addition to this once again yeah in addition to this at the meeting we have to give him an opportunity of being heard orally as well this uh, we are giving a power to the retiring auditor a power to make a written representation if the retiring auditor is misusing this power and if nclt is convinced about it then nclt will pass an order saying no need to send a copy of the written representation to all the members no need to read it out at the meeting also okay then coming to our next discussion what if the auditor acts fraudulently what if the auditor does a fraud if the auditor himself i am not talking about auditor finding a fraud over here i am talking about a case where auditor himself is doing a fraud if the auditor himself does a fraud then in that case the central government or any other person can go and complain to the nclt or nclt can also take action suo moto either central government or any person can go and complain to nclt or nclt may also take action suo moto when the nclt take action nclt will take action if the nclt is convinced that the auditor has abetted or colluded in a fraud either the auditor has acted fraudulently or he has abetted or colluded in any fraud relating to cod relating to company officer or director either he has done the fraud or he has abetted or colluded in a fraud the fraud is relating to what the fraud is relating to company officer or director if the nclt is convinced that the auditor has done some fraud like this then the nclt will pass an order first of all they will ask the company to change the auditor then if central government was the one who had made an application to nclt then in that case nclt within 15 days itself will ask the company to change the auditor but new auditor in his place will be appointed by the central government and this auditor this fraud auditor for next 5 years he cannot be appointed as auditor of any company and he will be punished under section 447 also understanding everybody so if the auditor himself does a fraud then either the central government or any other concerned person can go and complain to nclt or nclt can also take action through a moto but nclt will take action only if nclt is convinced that either the auditor has done fraud or the auditor has abetted or colluded in any fraud the fraud is relating to the company officer or director of the company in what action will nclt take nclt will first of all ask the company to change the auditor if central government was the one who had made the application to nclt then within 15 days itself the nclt will ask the company to remove this auditor and another auditor in his place will be appointed by the central government and then finally we learned that what will happen to this fraud auditor now for the next 5 years this fraud auditor cannot be auditor in any company for the next 5 years and he will also be punished under section 447 then coming to our next discussion section 141 the qualifications of auditor only a chartered accountant can be appointed as an auditor a practicing chartered accountant he can be an individual can also be a firm can be llp also firm will include llp also for this purpose so we either we can appoint an individual auditor or we can appoint a firm if we are appointing a firm majority of the partners should be practicing chartered accountants and if the firm is having non chartered accountants also as partners then only those partners can do the audit and sign on behalf of the firm only those partners who are chartered accountants only they can do the audit and sign on behalf of the firm understanding so qualifications of auditor auditor has to be chartered accountant and when i say chartered accountant it means he has to be a member of icai like if you are an acca you can't be an auditor of the company 
company under companies act you have to be a chartered accountant you have to be a member of ICI a practicing chartered accountant you have to be as per ICI only then you can be appointed as an auditor even a firm a partnership firm or an LLP can be appointed as an auditor but majority of the partners of that firm should be practicing chartered accountants and if the firm is having uh, you know um, other non-CS also as partners only those partners who are chartered accountants only they can do the audit and sign on behalf of the firm then coming to the disqualifications who cannot be appointed as an auditor number one a body corporate cannot be appointed as an auditor a company cannot be appointed as an auditor but one exception is llp yes llp is a body corporate but llp can be appointed as an auditor then officer or employee of the company can't be appointed as auditor his partners and employees also can't be appointed as auditor and director and kmp anyways can't be auditor because they are officer or employee of the company their relatives also can't be appointed as auditors guys disqualification should not have any problem in full depth solid two hours we had spent to learn all the disqualifications along with all the questions guys so you should have absolutely no problem in the disqualifications discussion you should be able to grasp it really 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 well so one final revision of disqualifications come on everybody set up straight and give me your 200 percent who cannot be appointed as auditor body corporate cannot be appointed as auditor then if i am officer or employee of the company i can't be appointed as auditor if i am officer or employee of the company my partner my employee also can't be appointed as auditor if I am director or KMP, I anyways can't be appointed as auditor. My relative also can't be appointed as auditor. Point to be noted, relative of director and KMP can't be auditor, but relative of other employees can be auditor. I'll repeat one final time. Relatives of directors and KMP cannot be auditor, but relatives of other employees, other officers of the company can be appointed as auditor. Then if the person himself or his partners or his relatives, if they hold any securities or any interest in cash or in subsidiary of holding company, then in the company, that person can't be appointed as auditor. However, however, the relatives for them alone, we have a limit of one lakh. If the relatives are holding securities in the company or in associate or in subsidiary or in holding company or in subsidiary of the holding company up to one lakh rupees face value, then the shareholders can be appointed as, then the relatives, then that person can be appointed as auditor of the company guys i have again brought you back to the uh, page where i had discussed the disqualifications with you i think you'll be able to grasp it better from here so number one body corporate cannot be appointed as auditor number two officer or employee can't be auditor his partner and employee also can't be auditor director kmp anyways can't be auditor and his relative also can't be auditor but relatives of other officers and employees can be auditor then number three, if the person himself or his partners or his relatives, if they are holding any securities or interest in cash or in subsidiary of holding company, then this person in this company, he can't be auditor. But however, for relatives alone, there's an exception. Relatives can hold securities up to 1 lakh face value. If they're holding securities more than 1 lakh face value, then in that case, the, comp uh, the auditor will get 60 days time to take corrective action. Within 60 days time, we have to ensure that the securities come back within 1 lakh. Understanding everybody, the person himself, nor neither the person himself, nor his partners, nor his relatives, none of them should hold securities in cash or in subsidiary of the holding company. The relatives alone can hold in cash or in subsidiary of holding company. The relatives alone can hold in cash or in subsidiary of holding company up to 1 lakh face value. But if it exceeds 1 lakh face value, then the person will get 60 days time to take corrective action and ensure that it goes within 1 lakh then he can continue as auditor. But even beyond 60 days, if the relatives are still holding more than 1 lakh face value, then this person is now attracting a disqualification. He'll have to vacate the office and he cannot continue to be appointed as auditor. And I hope you remember who is relative, guys. We had discussed about who is relative. Relative will include my spouse. Relative will include members of the headship. Relative will include my parents, my brothers, my sister, my children and their spouses. Relative will include my spouse, my parents, my brothers, my sister, my children and their spouses and will also include members of the HUF. Then coming to the fourth disqualification, the person himself, neither the person himself, nor his partners, nor his relatives, none of them should be indebted to the cash or to subsidiary of holding company for more than 5 lakhs. Then neither the person himself, nor his partner, nor his relatives, none of them should have given a guarantee to cash or to subsidiary of holding company for more than 1 lakh. 
then the person should not be having any business relationship with cash or subsidiary of holding company, but he can have a business relationship in ordinary course of business. He can also render all those professional services, which as an auditor, he is allowed to render. Then if he's in full-time employment, he cannot be an auditor of the company. We will see how many companies is he already auditing. Minus 1% company, small company, dormant company, and private companies with paid up share capital less than 100 crores. We will see the balance companies. This should not exceed 20. If this has already reached 20, then he cannot be auditor in another company. See, but then, however, for these companies, there is no limit. 1% company, small company, dormant company, and private companies with paid up share capital less than 100 crores. He can audit any number of these companies. There is no limit. Other companies only should not exceed 20. Then we learned if this person is convicted for any fraud by any court, if he's convicted for any fraud by any court, then for 10 years from the date of conviction, he cannot be appointed as auditor. But after 10 years, he can be appointed as auditor. Then finally, we learned if a person is rendering 144 services not to cash, if he's rendering 144 services only to CSH, only to company subsidiary or holding, if he's rendering 144 services, then in the company, this person can't be appointed as auditor. One final time, guys, body corporate can't be appointed as auditor, but LLP can be appointed as auditor. If I am an officer or employee of the company, I can't be auditor. My partner or employee also can't be auditor. Directors or KMPs also can't be auditor. And directors and KMPs, their relatives also can't be appointed as auditor. Relative means what? Relative means my spouse, my parents, my brothers and sisters, my children and their spouses and members of the HUF. Then if I myself or my partners or my relatives have any securities in cash or in subsidiary of holding company, then I can't be auditor in the company. I can't be auditor in the company, but my relatives can hold securities up to 1 lakh face value. If it exceeds 1 lakh face value, I will get 60 days time to ensure it is brought back within 1 lakh. If I'm able to do that, great. If I'm unable to do that, then after 60 days, I am ineligible to continue as an auditor. I'll have to vacate the office. Then if I myself or my partners or my relatives, have, uh, if we are indebted to the company more than 5 lakh, if we owe to the company more than 5 lakhs, then I can't be appointed as auditor in the company. Then if I or my partners or my relatives have given guarantee to cash or to subsidiary of holding company of more than 1 lakh rupees, then I can't be auditor in the company. Then if I'm having business relationship with cash or subsidiary of holding company, I can't be auditor. But if the business relationship is an ordinary course of business, or if the business relationship is in the form of professional services, which the auditor is allowed to render, then it will be allowed. Then if I'm already into full-time employment, I can't be an auditor of the company because only a practicing chartered accountant can be an auditor and not an employee chartered accountant. Then if I'm already auditing 20 companies, I cannot be auditor of more companies. However, there is no limit on 1% companies, small companies, dormant companies, and private companies with less than 100 crores paid up share capital. Then if I'm convicted by any court for any offense involving fraud, then for 10 years after the date of conviction, I can't be auditor in any company. But after 10 years are over, now I can again be auditors. I can, I can again be an auditor. And finally, if I am rendering section 144 service to the company or to the subsidiary or to the holding, if I'm rendering 144 service to the company or to the subsidiary or to the holding, then I cannot be appointed as auditor of the company. Now, what are these 144 services? Bookkeeping, accounting services, internal audit, development and implementation of financial information system, actuarial services, investment advisory services, investment banking services, then outsourced financial services and management services. All of these are 144 services. If I'm rendering any of these services, to the company or to the subsidiary or to the holding company, then in the company, I can't be appointed as auditor. This was a discussion with respect to the disqualifications. Then after the disqualifications, good number of questions we had seen and then coming to vacation of office. We learned that here when I was appointed as an auditor, I was not attracting a disqualification. But after the appointment of auditor, now I, if I'm attracting a disqualification, I'll have to vacate the office. Of course, it will result into casual vacancy, but I'll have to vacate the office. After appointment, if I attract a disqualification, I can't continue as auditor, I'll have to vacate the office. Then we spoke about remuneration. Remuneration of first auditor is decided by the board of directors. Remuneration of all subsequent auditors is fixed by the company, that is by the shareholders. Either in the general meeting, they'll fix an amount or they'll decide the manner in which the remuneration will be fixed. Even for government companies, it's going to be the same. The CNAD does not fix a remuneration. Either the remun if it's a first auditor, remuneration will be fixed by the board of directors. If subsequent auditor, remuneration will be fixed by the company in the general meeting. Either they'll fix the amount or they'll fix the manner. Then the remuneration will include audit fees, the fixed amount. It will also include out-of-pocket expenses and any other facility which has been given to the auditor. But if the auditor is rendering any other service to the company, then remuneration for that has to be over and above the remuneration, audit remuneration. 
if the auditor is rendering any other service for this also he deserves remuneration but that remuneration will not be included in this remuneration so if he is rendering some other service for this service he requires separate remuneration after remuneration after all of this we had discussed about cost audit under cost audit, we had learned that first of all, cost accounting records. By the way, cost audit section 148, remember the section number. Under cost audit, we had learned first of all, that cost accounting records, they don't have to be maintained by all the companies. Cost accounting records are a part of books of accounts of the company, but every company does not have to maintain cost accounting records. Cost accounting records has to be maintained only by those companies which fulfill these three conditions. Condition number one, it should be a domestic company or a foreign company, but it should not be a micro or a small entity. Number two, it should be producing goods or rendering services which are mentioned either in Table A or in Table B of companies, cost records and audit rules 2014. Condition number three, the overall turnover. Overall turnover means not just Table A, Table B. Overall turnover, all the goods and services put together should be at least 35 crores in the preceding financial year. So cost accounting records are not required for all companies. Cost accounting records are mandatory only for those companies which fulfill three criteria. Condition number one, domestic company or foreign company, just that it should not be micro or small enterprise. Condition number two, it must be producing goods or it must be providing services mentioned in table A or in table B. And this table A, table B is written where? In companies, cost records and audit rules 2014. And condition number three is that the overall turnover of this company, not just table A, table B turnover, overall turnover, turnover of the company has to be at least 35 crores in the preceding financial year. With respect to this multiple examples we had seen over here, then we said that just because we're maintaining cost accounting records doesn't mean we have to get them audited. Every company does not have to get the cost accounting records audited. Once you're preparing the cost accounting records, those cost accounting records have to be approved by the board. It has to be signed by a director who is authorized by the board, but audit is not required for every company. Cost audit is required only for companies which fulfill some criteria. Cost audit has to be done by CMA and the CMA who is doing the cost audit and the chartered accountant who is doing the statutory audit, they can't be the same person. Cost auditor has to be a different person. Statutory auditor has to be a different person. Then we learned which companies have to do cost audit, which companies have to do cost audit. See, listen, if you're maintaining cost accounting records, you will maintain cost accounting records only for table A products and table B products. So table A products, whatever cost accounting records you are maintaining, those records you will have to get them audited only if your company's overall turnover is at least 50 crores and table A, table B turnover is at least 25 crores. I'll repeat once again, listen carefully. See, first of all, every company does not have to maintain cost accounting records. Only companies which fulfill three criteria, only those companies have to maintain cost accounting records. Condition one, they should be domestic company or foreign company, but should not be micro or small enterprise. Condition number two, they, are, uh, they must be producing some goods under table A or table B. Condition number three, their overall turnover should be at least 35 crores. If all these three conditions are fulfilled, then they'll have to maintain cost accounting records. These cost accounting records have to be approved by the board and they have to be signed by one director who is authorized by the board. But just because the company is maintaining cost accounting records, it doesn't have to get it audited. Audit will be required only in some companies. Now, if the company is maintaining cost accounting records, company will maintain only for table A and table B. Only for table A products and table B products, only the company will be maintaining cost accounting records. Now, table A cost accounting records have to be audited by the company. When, where did it go? One second. Ah, here. Table A. Table A cost accounting records, which the company is maintaining, when will the company get them audited? Only if the overall turnover is at least 50 crores and table A, B turnover is at least 25 crores. Whatever cost accounting records the company is maintaining for table B products, the company will get those cost accounting records audited only if overall turnover is at least 100 crores and uh, table A, table B turnover is at least 35 crores. Okay, table A products, whatever cost accounting records are being maintained, those cost accounting records will be audited only if overall turnover is at least 50 crores and table A, table B turnover is at least 25 crores. Table B products, Cost accounting records will be audited only if overall turnover is at least 100 crores and table A, table B turnover is at least 35 crores. 
there are multiple around 12, 11, 12 examples we had seen with respect to this. Then we had learned about appointment of the cost auditor. Here, shareholders don't appoint the cost auditor. The audit committee will recommend to the board and the board will appoint the cost auditor. So cost auditor is a CMA who is appointed by the board of directors. He is appointed within 180 days from the commencement of the financial year he is appointed and he is appointed for a year. No concept of five years appointment over here. We appoint him for a year. Okay. So we appoint him within 180 days from the commencement of the financial year. And we will appoint him for a financial year. Uh, now, he will hold office till he submits the cost audit report for the financial year for which he is appointed. Then once a company in appoints a cost auditor, company will inform the cost auditor that, hey, listen, you have been appointed. Company will also inform the central government, inform CRA2, that whom is a company informing us, cost auditor. Then we learned that the cost auditor has to give to the company a written consent saying that he is willing to be appointed as cost auditor. And he also has to give the similar certificate which we had seen earlier under statutory auditor as well. Then the cost auditor can be removed. Who appointed the cost auditor? The board of directors. So obviously, who can remove the cost auditor? The board of directors. But before we remove him, we have to give him an opportunity of being heard. And we also have to put down in writing that why exactly are we removing him? He can also resign on his own. In case it's a casual vacancy, within 30 days, board will fill in this vacancy. The cost auditor has to follow the cost accounting standards. Then finally, the cost auditor will prepare a cost audit report within 180 days from the end of the financial year. See, the cost auditor is appointed within 180 days from the commencement of the financial year. He is appointed for a financial year within 180 days from the commencement of the financial year. Then once the financial year is over, within the next 180 days, he'll have to give the cost audit report. Till he gives a cost audit report, till then he will be the cost auditor. Are you understanding? Like, for example, for example, listen, let's say financial year 23-24. Commencement of the financial year is 1st April 2023. From this date, within 180 days, the cost auditor will be appointed. His appointment will be within 180 days from the commencement of the year. Then, when will the year end? The year will end on 31st March 2024, guys. From the end of the year, within 180 days, he has to give the cost audit report he has to give. So, he will be the auditor from the date of appointment till he gives the cost audit report. Now, understood. We have 180 days criteria here also, here also. This is for appointment. From the date of, from the commencement of the year, within 180 days, we will appoint him as a cost auditor. Okay. Then, uh, once a year comes to an end, within 180 days, he has to give the cost audit report. Now, he will be a, a auditor. He will be cost auditor of the company till he gives a cost audit report. Till then, he is going to be the cost auditor of the company. So, he will give the cost audit report in CRA3. Along with that, he will give his qualifications, reservations, observations and suggestions to the board of directors. Now, the board of directors will have to pass it on to the central government within 30 days. Along with the cost audit report, they'll have to give their information and explanation with respect to the qualifications and reservations. And then if the central government requires any more information after looking at the cost audit report, the central government can ask the company for more information also. So the cost auditor will give the cost audit report to whom? See who appointed him, the board. So obviously he will give the cost audit report to the board. The cost audit report will be addressed to the board. So the cost auditor will give the cost audit report to the board of directors within 180 days from the end of the financial year. Along with that, he will give his qualifications, reservations, observations and suggestions also. QROS, qualifications, re uh, re reservations, observations and suggestions. The board of directors will pass on the cost audit report along with their information and explanation on the qualifications and reservations. On the qualifications and reservations, the board has to give their information and explanation and all of this will be submitted to the central government within 30 days. If the central government requires any more information, central government can ask the company. So under cost auditor, first we learned that uh, which companies have to maintain cost accounting records. Cost accounting records, if the company is maintaining, it will maintain only for table A products and table B products. Then we learn if the company is maintaining cost accounting records, does it have to get them audited? Which companies will have to get them audited? We saw. Then we learned after this the whole procedure for appointment of the cost auditor. We spoke about removal, resignation and casual vacancy of cost auditor. Then we spoke about the cost audit report. Alright guys, this was our entire discussion, our entire revision with respect to cost audit section number 148. Now, coming to the powers of the auditor. The auditor has totally three powers. Number one, he can access the books of accounts and vouchers of the company at any time. In case he requires any information and explanation, for the purpose of doing the audit, he can ask for whatever information and explanation he requires from any officer of the company, he can ask. And number three, 
he can not only access the company's books he can also access the subsidiary's books but he can access the subsidiary and associates books only to the extent to which it is required to audit the cfs like, are you understanding? Are you listening? Come on, come on, last part of the chapter. You can't give up at this stage. So the powers of the auditor, the auditor has a power. Number one, he can access the books of accounts of the company. Number two, he can ask whatever information and explanation he requires for the purpose of the audit. And number three, he can not only access the books of accounts of the company, he can also access the books of accounts of the subsidiaries and the associates to the extent to which it is required for the purpose of preparing CFS. Now tell me, in case a company has a branch office and if the branch office is audited by some other branch auditor, even the branch audit books can the statutory auditor, in, uh, can he access? Yes, he can access not only the, he see, even if the branch is being audited by some other branch auditor, still he can access that branch's books of accounts also. Okay, so the company's auditor can access the books of accounts of the company, including the books of accounts of the branches also. Even if the branch is being audited by some other branch auditor, still the branch's books of accounts the auditor can inspect, he, he, he can take access to. Then he can ask whatever information and explanation he requires for the purpose of the audit. And he can also access the subsidiary and associates books of accounts, but only to the extent to which it is required to audit the CFS. Then coming to the duties of the auditor, the first duty of the auditor is that he has to inquire uh, about six things. He has to inquire whether the loans and advances have been properly secured or not, whether the assets of the company in the form of shares and debentures of other companies have been sold at a loss. Basically, has the company sold shares and debentures of other companies at a loss? Then number three, whether loans and advances are being shown as deposits or vice versa. Then number four, whether directors' personal expenses are debited to the company's PL account. Then number five, whether book entries are prejudicial to the company's interest. And number six, if the books of accounts mention that the company has allotted shares during the year, then against the shares, has the company received the money or not? If the company has not received the money against the shares, then whether the accounting treatment is correct or not. So the auditor has to inquire about these six things and about these six things he will write in the audit report only if there is something negative. If these six things are all fine, he will not write in the audit report. What are the six things? Number one, whether the secured loans are properly secured or not. Number two, whether the company has sold securities of other companies at a loss. But this point will not apply to investment companies and banking companies. Then number three, whether loans and advances are wrongly shown as deposits or vice versa. Number four, whether personal expenses of directors have been debited to the company's p &L account. Number five, whether book entries are prejudicial to the company's interest. And number six, if the books of accounts say that the shares have been allotted during the year, then did we receive money against the shares or not? If we have not received the money yet, whether the accounting treatment is correct and regular and not misleading. This was the first duty of the auditor to inquire. Second duty of the auditor is that he has to express an opinion. He is going to be examining the books of accounts and the financial statements of the company, right? On that basis, he has to express an opinion whether according to him, the books of accounts and the financial statements give a true and fair view of the state of affairs of the company as at the end of the year, profit or loss for the year and cash flow for the year. I'll repeat once again the second uh, duty of the auditor. He is going to uh, audit the books of accounts and financial statements of the company. On that basis, he has to give an opinion whether according to him and whether to the best of his knowledge and information, whether the books of accounts and financial statements give a true and fair view of the state of affairs of the company as at the end of the year, profit or loss for the year and cash flow for the year. Then coming to the third duty of the auditor, he has to prepare an audit report. Now the audit report when he's preparing, he has to keep in mind the accounting standards, the standards of auditing and the provisions of this act. Now what are the contents of the auditor's report? If you remember, we had learned the auditor's report content in two parts. We had learned what are the contents of the audit report as per the act and then we saw some additional contents of the audit report as per the rules also. Right, guys. But anyways, this audit report has to be addressed to whom? Who appointed the auditor? The shareholders. So the audit report will be addressed to the shareholders. So in the audit report, what will the auditor mention? As per the act, he will mention whether whatever information and explanation he required, whether he received it or not. Then whether the books of accounts have been kept properly by the company, whether proper returns we have received from the branch offices. Then whether the in case the branch office is being audited by some other branch auditor, then did we get branch audit report from the branch auditor or or not. Then the balance sheet and PL should tally with the books of accounts of the company. Whether the financial statements are asked per the accounting standards. Then the auditor will give his observations and comments on the financial statements of the company. He will also mention whether any director is disqualified from being appointed. Then he'll give any qualifications, reservations or adverse remarks if any and whether the internal financial controls are adequate and effective or not. 
So what are the contents of the audit report? Number one, whatever information and explanation he had asked, did he receive or not? If he has not received, what is the effect on the financial statements? Then number two, whether he is maintaining proper books of accounts, whether the company has maintained proper books of accounts or not, and whether proper returns, remember in accounts of companies chapter, we had learned proper periodical summarized returns. So branch office has to send to the registered office proper periodical summarized returns. So those returns, whether the company has received or not from the branch offices. Number three, if the branch office is being audited by some other branch auditor, then has a branch auditor sent the branch or, uh, has a branch auditor sent the branch audit report? And if yes, how has the auditor dealt with it? Then number four, whether the company's balance sheet and PL are matching with the company's books of accounts or not. Then number five, whether the financial statements are matching with the accounting standards. Then number six, the auditor has to give his observations and comments on the financial statements. Then number seven, whether any director is being disqualified. Number eight, he has to give his qualifications, reservations, or adverse remarks, if any. And number nine, whether the internal financial controls are adequate and effective or not. These are the nine contents of the audit report as per the act. Then as per the rules, we have some more contents. Number one, whether the company has properly disclosed all the pending litigations or not. Then number two, whether the company has made provisions for material foreseeable losses. And number three, whether the company has properly transferred money to IEPF. Then we have some more points over here, like for example, whether the company has defaulted with respect to dividend, then whether the company, uh, uh, whether the company's accounting software is maintaining the audit trail and the edit lock properly. So the, there are extra contents as per the rules, whether the company has properly disclosed the pending litigations against the company, then whether the company has made a provision with respect to material foreseeable losses, and whether the company has properly transferred money to IEPF, whether dividend and all dividend provisions are properly being complied with, and whether the accounting software which the company is using is properly maintaining audit trail and edit log. These are the contents of the audit report as per the act and as per the rules. In addition to this, the auditor will also have to include CARO in his report if CARO is applicable to that particular audit. Then he'll have to include CARO as well. Then we learned if the company is a government company, then the CNAG will appoint the auditor. When the CNAG appoints the auditor, the CNAG will give directions to the auditor that how should the audit be done. So the, in the audit report, in addition to whatever we just learned, in the audit report, the auditor will also have to mention that what are the directions which the CNAG gave and what is the effect of those directions. Then if the CNAG thinks it is required, within 60 days, he can also order a supplementary audit. And he can also order a test audit as per Section 19A of CNAG, Duties, Powers and Conditions of Services Act 1971. Supplementary audit, remember, within 60 days of receipt of the audit report, he will uh, order supplementary audit. Is supplementary audit mandatory? No. Supplementary audit means additional audit. Audit has already happened. If CNAG thinks further audit is required, additional audit is required, then within 60 days of receiving the audit report, he will order supplementary audit. Test audit he will order under Section 19A of CNAG Duties, Powers and Conditions of Services Act 1971. Section 144, I've already discussed with you. Coming to branch audit now. Branch audit, if the branch is in India, either the company's statutory auditor itself can audit the branch office also. But if the branch is outside India, then it will be audited by either the company's statutory auditor or by any other person who is eligible to be appointed as auditor in that foreign company. I'll repeat once again, if the branch office happens to be in India, then the company's auditor itself can audit the branch office or we can have separate branch audit, uh, separate branch auditor, but the branch auditor should also be a person who is qualified to be appointed as an auditor of the company. Even he should not attract any disqualification. However, if the branch is outside India, then either the company's statutory auditor itself can do the branch audit as well, or any other person who is eligible to be appointed as an auditor in that foreign country, even he can be appointed as a branch auditor. But however, the branch auditor will prepare the branch audit report and give to whom? To the statutory auditor and not to the shareholders. See guys, the cost audit report will be given by the cost auditor to whom? The cost audit report will be given by the cost auditor to the board of directors and the board of directors will pass it on to the central government. The audit report, if you see the statutory audit report, the statutory auditor will send it to the members. It is addressed to the members. If you look at the branch audit report, the branch audit report, if you see the branch auditor, he addresses it to whom? He gives it to whom? He gives it to the auditor of the company. Are you understanding everybody? Yes. So if you look at the cost audit report, the cost auditor gives it to the 
board of directors of the company cost audit report is addressed to the board of directors of the company audit report is addressed to the members of the company the branch audit report is addressed not to the members the branch audit report is addressed to the auditor of the company okay guys then finally coming to the last discussion on reporting on frauds when the auditor is doing the fraud if he identifies some fraud in the company see he himself has not done the fraud the directors have not come and told him about the fraud then he is doing the audit work he has himself found a fraud in the company guys now what will he do if the fraud is a small fraud which means if it is less than 1 crore he will prepare one fraud report in the fraud report he will write about three things the nature of the fraud what is the amount involved in the fraud and who are the parties involved three things he will put guys nature of the fraud the amount of the fraud and who are the parties involved and he will give this fraud report to the competent authority understanding everybody so uh, once again in case the com in case the fraud is a small fraud small fraud means less than 1 crore he will prepare a fraud report in that fraud report he will write three things nature of the fraud what is the amount of the fraud and who are the parties involved three things he will write in the fraud report and he will give it to the competent authority which means audit committee or board of directors as a case may be and the board of directors will disclose about it in the board report story over but however if the fraud is a big fraud if it is at least 1 crore then again first he will prepare the fraud report containing the same three things only the the uh, the nature of the fraud the amount involved and the parties involved and again he will give it to the competent authority within 2 days he will give it to the competent authority and he will ask the competent authority to give reply within 45 days then once he receives the reply of the competent authority he will have to send a, a copy of that fraud report along with the reply of the competent authority and along with his comments on that reply within 15 days to the central government see guys i'll put it again for you over here if the fraud happens to be of less than 1 crore that is if the fraud happens to be a small fraud if the fraud happens to be of less than 1 crore then the auditor will first of all prepare the a uh, fraud audit report in the fraud audit report he will put totally three things guys he will first put about the nature of the fraud then the amount of the fraud and who are the parties involved in the fraud then after that the auditor will give this fraud audit report to whom he will give this fraud audit report to the competent authority and he will give the fraud audit report within 2 days once he comes to know about the fraud within 2 days he will give it to the competent authority and number 3 in the board report they have to disclose about this fraud and what action they did what action the company took uh, about this fraud what remedial action they took this is it about small frauds but however if the fraud happens to be a big fraud if the fraud's value is at least 1 crore rupees even in that case first of all the fraud audit report will be prepared by the auditor even in that case the fraud audit report will be given by the fraud uh, by the auditor to the competent authority within 2 days itself but we will not stop over there the auditor will also ask the competent authority that you have to give a reply the competent authority has to give a reply within 45 days the competent authority has to give a reply then once the auditor receives a reply the auditor has to send to the central government within the next 15 days after receiving the reply auditor will send totally three things to the central government number 1 the fraud audit report which he has prepared number 2 the reply which he received from the competent authority and number 3 he has to give his comments on this reply sometimes what happens is this competent authority may not have replied within 45 days in that case he will mention that also he will inform to the central government when i am saying sending to the central government he will send it to the ministry of corporate affairs secretary secretary of the ministry of corporate affairs it will be sent within 15 days all right along with this the uh, auditor will also send to the ministry of corporate affairs simultaneously one email saying that like this i have sent all this to you and all this will be sent by the auditor in a sealed envelope it will be printed on his letter pad which clearly mentions his name his membership uh, uh, number his contact details his email id all that should be mentioned on the letter pad understanding everybody yes guys so now however what if he doesn't do this reporting properly if he doesn't report properly if it's a listed company he will be punished with 5 lakhs penalty and if it's an unlisted company he will be punished with 1 lakh penalty
okay so this is about fraud while doing the audit if the auditor finds a fraud if the fraud is a small fraud which means less than 1 crore rupees then the auditor will prepare a fraud audit a fraud report he will prepare that fraud report will contain details about the nature of the fraud the amount involved and the parties involved and the auditor will prepare this fraud audit report and give it to the competent authority within 2 days itself and then in the board report the company with the board of directors will make proper disclosure but however if it is a big fraud even over here the the auditor will prepare the fraud report containing the same three things even over here the fraud report will be sent to the competent authority within 2 days but here extra steps are there we will ask the competent authority to reply within 45 days now the fraud report plus a reply plus auditor's comments on the reply will be sent to the secretary of mca within 15 days okay and then simultaneously the auditor will also send an email to the secretary saying that like this we have sent all this to you the come the auditor will send this to the uh, secretary of mc in a sealed envelope printed on his letter pad that letter pad should clearly mention his name his membership number his email id his contact details and all all right and then finally we learnt what if he doesn't does but what if he doesn't do this reporting properly then if it's a listed company he will be punished with 5 lakh rupees and if it's an unlisted company he will be punished with 1 lakh rupees whatever we learnt about fraud over here also applies to the cost auditor to the branch auditor and to the secretarial auditor it applies to all of them but it doesn't apply to internal auditor income tax auditor and gst auditor whatever we have learnt about fraud will apply to the statutory auditor to the branch auditor to the cost auditor and to the secretarial auditor but it will not apply to the gst auditor to the tax auditor and to the internal auditor and then finally coming to the last part of our discussion cost audit and all i have discussed with you coming to the last part of our discussion whenever the company holds a general meeting the general meeting notice the company will send to the auditor also and the auditor has to attend the meeting either the auditor has to himself attend the meeting or he has to send an authorized representative on his behalf he has to attend the meeting can he also speak at the meeting he can speak at the meeting only on those matters which are connected to the fact that he is an auditor so connected to the fact that he is an auditor connected to the books of accounts of the company connected to the financial statements connected to his role as an auditor he can speak at the meeting apart from that he cannot speak at the meeting but he has to attend the meeting okay and in case he has given any qualifications observations or any adverse remarks it has to be read out at the meeting the whole audit report need not be read out at the general meeting only his qualifications observations and comments have to be read out at the general meeting getting it guys so this is it about our entire entire revision i tried giving you a super quick revision of the whole chapter it's like a good refreshing uh, it's, it's like it's like a good you know it's like we're pressing the refresh button in our memory we had discussed this whole chapter in parts now we've discussed it all together i think it's around 1 hour we spent around 1 hour but it was solid revision according to me all right guys that's it with this session i am hoping you're thorough thorough really thorough with the auditor's chapter we spent a good amount of time doing the whole chapter in good detail in full depth and then we've topped it up with this one hour solid revision as well i am really hoping this revision makes a huge difference to your confidence to your preparation i have recorded this it's it's almost 3 in the night i have recorded it at this point of time in the night and i am really hoping that it was worth it so i'll close the session over here guys i'll see you in the next session with another chapter thank you bye bye